Greetings everyone, in this video I'm going to be talking about the three main errors that people make about Christianity. Well, this person at least made, a lot of people make a lot of different errors, but um, this person I had a Twitter interaction with yesterday made very blatant and obvious errors, and he was very hard-headed. He didn't accept the fact that he said something really blatantly wrong. He, in fact, argued that, no, I was the wrong one, the guy who believes in that religion and reads numerous texts. No, I am the one who's wrong about my own, own religion. He's going to tell me, and he's going to atheist explain me about what my religion is. So uh, it kind of inspired me to make this video because I suppose a lot of people have, I guess, they don't know this. The reason why uh, I'm a bit more, how should I say, fiery is because this is this guy markets himself as like some, you know, religion. I don't want to say specialist, but like someone interested in religion. He gives you this air that he like knows about religion and is interested about what different religions believe. But like, how are you going to make a basic mistake on like the most popular religion on earth like this? Right. I mean, I guess. There's like a couple of weird Protestant groups that believe in this kind of stuff that he's saying, but like Christianity is not Protestantism, right? Um, and even within Protestantism, most people don't believe in this stuff that he's saying. So he said, he tweeted, three essential concepts in Christian theology are the Trinity, the Incarnation, the Atonement. It's not clear these concepts are even coherent. Three people cannot be one, the same person. An eternal God cannot come into time and die, and no one can die for another sin. So... The reason why I kind of, again, like my tweet was like, how do you get all three points wrong? I mean, we don't, we don't believe in them in the way you think we believe in them. And he, um, he asked me, you know, he said, oh, you know, you know, point out to me a single false claim. So even he, he admits that, you know, this is supposed to be, you know, these are, th these points are supposed to explain what we believe. And if you look at the tweet, it, I think it's actually even clearer. But, you know, this response is going to show you even more obviously that um, he's acting as if that's what we openly believe. And no, we don't. Right. Some do, but like most Christians don't. So the, the one that, that's the most simple one, I said, you know, three people cannot be one the same person. Easy done. Trinitarians never claim the Father, Son, Holy Spirit are the same person. So I made that statement to kind of say, you know, like if you're trying to say that's what it leads to, like, OK, you know, like then that's a different topic. But like. I'm not reading that, right? I, I don't think that's what you're saying. What you're saying is what we are claiming. We never claim they're the same person. We, we claim that they're God. We claim that they're one God. But that doesn't mean that they're the same person. Uh, it's, in fact, quite the opposite. We've claimed, we've argued against that historically. So you have no clue what you're talking about. And I'm not gaslighting because he's like, oh, you're gaslighting me. Like, <laughs> okay. Uh I'm not gaslighting. You're just a fraud. And then he he basically uses the logical problem to Trinity argument, pretty much. So at that point, I was like, okay, this guy's not worth talking to because he's clearly he's clearly off the off his rockers. Okay, there's no dialogue to be had here with someone who's this ignorant. Uh, I just said, you know, like if you're, you're going to speak the the language of analytic philosophy, go read Dr. Bo Branson. So that's basically what I posted, and I've been responding to him ever since. As you can see, people. Some people railed them, railed on them afterwards. But um, what I want to do is kind of just for this video is just explain why the claims he is making are wrong, right? So the first claim, and that's to me the most important one, um, is the idea that we believe and worship, that we think that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are somehow the same person because we say they're one God. If you've been watching my channel, for those who've been watching my channel, I have been railing off against any theology that leads to that conclusion. I've been railing off against Roman Catholic theology, which, again, they don't believe that. They don't claim that, right? But their theology leads to that conclusion. So, again, if you make an argument like that, okay, that's fair. But I don't think he's making that kind of argument, right? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think this... I don't think when he made that tweet and when he, like, made this point... You know, Trinitarians claim A, you know, that he's basically saying that we are claiming A, B, and C. And that there's one God, there are exact three divine persons, each divine person is God. And he's like, okay, so you guys believe in three gods. Like, that's basically, he, he says that that's what we're claiming. No, we don't claim that, right? And so what needs to happen here, and I've done numerous different videos on this personally, um, multiple videos on the Trinity, on, you know, how God is one. 
but I'm going to kind of summarize those videos. If you want to watch them in more detail with, you know, historical citations and academic citations, whatever, you know, rocks you guys boat, um, you can watch those streams and videos. It will be in the link in the description below. But to kind of summarize, uh, the problem with this argument, it's not even, even an argument, but this kind of description, I suppose, is that there is exactly one God. Yes, but what does one God mean? Um, in my article on Substack, I actually point out that the name God can mean many different things, right? So it can mean a person, it can mean an uncaused cause, it can mean a person possessing divine nature, it can mean the divinity that proceeds from the divine nature, right? It, it can mean a, a multitude of different things, right? So the, cre the Nikian Creed, in fact, says that the one God is the Father, right? And this is, it, this is the same kind of reason why in biblical theology, uh, man is called Adam. So if you didn't know that in Hebrew, uh, man, right, the generic signification of man is called Adam. And the first man was also Adam. That's not a, that's not a coincidence, right? The, the logic kind of is that human nature is associated with Adam because he's the first man. Um, so he's the unbegotten cause of humanity. And the logic kind of applies to God, right? So God is the unbegotten cause of humanity and he has a word and he has a spirit, right? And though he has these things, these things that he has are divine persons. And so on that virtue, they're also called God because of that essential communion that they share with. This, essential, this union of, in essence, right? This essence that we call divine nature, the name we give for the divine nature is God, right? So God is a divine name and when we talk about the divinity of the Father, the divinity of the Son, the divinity of the Holy Spirit, we're not talking as if they have separate divinities, right? Because God, essentially speaking, is a being that's, that's dissoluble, right? He cannot be dissolved. Indissoluble, um, I can't say that term properly, but he can't be dissolved. He's a simple being, so he's not composite. He's not made of parts. Um, and so when we speak of, again, the divinity of the Father, the divinity of the Son, it's the same divinity, right? And it proceeds from uh, the essence of the Father. And so this is why we will also say that the divinity, and this is what St. Gregory of Nyssa says in On Not Three Gods, he says that divinity um, is a name of an operation, is a name of an energy. And since the divine persons have the same nature, they also have the same energy. And so divinity being an energy, they have the same divinity. So they're all one God, right? So to say that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three gods will basically mean be you know it will basically like be like saying that divinity has three different sources and they are the, these divinities are distinct from each other. But that's blatant polytheism, and that's been attacked uh, in Christian history and Christian philosophy for a very long time. Again, you know, right? like for a very very long time, right? And so I guess you know. You, know, you can get into the question of, well, how doesn't, you know, you say three, doesn't that destroy unity? So that gets into numbers, you know, short answer will be no. Um, try, you know, uh, plurality and unity are not dialectically opposed to each other, right? Um, the one, you know, plurality can be formed from the one and the one can be formed from plurality. I mean, you can talk, talk, think about this in terms of numbers, you know, um, two, three, four, five, six, and you know, these plural numbers, they all are based off of one, but one itself uh, is based off of the, the plural numbers. You know, we're talking about 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, etc. Right? So plurality and unity, even in mathematical sense, coexist. They're not dialectically opposed to each other. They don't destroy each other. In fact, they kind of need each other. Right? And so we will say that the ultimate base of reality, that is God himself, is a union between plurality and, you know, oneness. And in fact, unity, I mean, Again, unity, there's different definitions of the word unity, right? We don't have to just accept the definition of, oh, it just means one. Um, for example, at the time of the 4th, 3rd century, etc., unity generally meant becoming one, which implied that there are things that are made one, right? It, it implies plural things, basically, that there's a union. If there's a union, there are plural things that came together and were united. I mean, some people believe that's what unity meant. And if you believe in the Trinity, well, it's pretty easy to argue for that unity. And uh, I guess I will also say that 
to kind of like get to the simpler level because I, I guess for some people this might be too out there too abstract or whatever i don't think it is too complex but um what i will say is that we can use an analogy like it's it's a really like bad analogy but it does get the point across i mean you you, know, you have this pen let's say there's me and a different guy we're in the same room and we share one pen right we share it together right does that mean that we have two pens or do we have one pen obviously we have one pen even though we share it share it with each other so like that the divinity of god is shared the difference is you know um the pen is something external to us but the son the holy spirit is something internal to the father's essence right because he generates those persons and generation as opposed to creating things out of his will and this is the athanasian point against Arius, is that the difference between generation and creation is that when you're creating you're creating something external to yourself so creation is not you know it doesn't have essential similarity with god but when you're generating you are generating in another person of the same substance right so again with human beings or with animals i mean adam begot seth so seth has the same nature as adam does right they're both men because he was you know he was caused by a man uh Eve also has the same nature as Adam because although she wasn't begotten by Adam, she proceeds from Adam. And you can already see that this analogy of unbegotten, begotten, proceeding, well, that's how we distinguished the persons of the Trinity. And this is in the New Testament. You know, the, the scripture speaks of uh, the Son as being begotten from the Father. The Father is unbegotten. And the Holy Spirit, according to John 15, 26, proceeds uh, from the Father, right? So the, the man being made in the image of God also exists in the same manner. So... A potential objection then will be, so you're talking about, you know, the analogy of sharing things, right? Well, you know, will is a faculty of nature, you know, mutability, right? We share these natural characteristics, but we don't particularize them in union with each other, right? So for example, we're both mutable, but I'm in a different spot than you are, right? So there's no uni unity there. Um, what another example I can use, I mean, we have human will, Right? We both have a human will, we both have free choice, but we don't choose the same thing. Right? There's no unity in our will, we choose different things. Right? Sometimes we choose things that oppose each other. Right? So there is separation for human beings. But as I said before, because God's essence is not co composite, it's not dissoluble, um, you cannot dissolve God's divinity. Um, the persons are not spatiotemporally separated from each other, right? There is no spatiotemporal separation. So any act that the Father does, what does the Son say in Scripture? Whatever the Father does, I look at it and I do the same, right? And that's that's a natural thing for them, right? That's When I say natural, I mean according to their nature, according to their essence. Not by compulsion or obligation or even really, you know, free choice in the human sense, but free choice in the divine sense, right? So the persons of the Trinity also have the same will, right? And it's the will of the Father, which is, again, that's the biblical name of the divine will. So the will of the Father is shared by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so when they create the world, the, the Son doesn't say, well, you know what? I don't think we should do this, right? No, he is. He himself also makes that decision. The Holy Spirit himself also makes this decision. And so all these, all these divine properties and names like life, right? So the Son says, I have life in myself, right? Um, that refers to a, you know, essential property of God that the son has in himself, not that he gets it from a different source externally, but he internally has that, uh, from the father. So the sameness of the divine persons is their essence, right? They have the same essence and we name this essence God, just like we name human nature man. Right now, depending on the la language, right? For example, in Turkish, actually, um, man generally is not applied to particulars but for um for you know in in greek and english right we say you know there are two men in this room well that's actually grammatically incorrect and it's a grammatical abuse because man refers to the universal human nature of you know man right but we you know it's okay to kind of make that abuse because you know we don't we don't mean that you know i have a body and a soul and you have a different body and a soul. You don't have you don't have a soul. Or anything like we don't we're not claiming that when we say say two men. We just say there are two particulars. We just we're just not 
naming their particular names, right? So maybe they're Peter and Paul, right? And so Peter and Paul, you say they're two men, so, and that's what you mean, right? So that's what we understand. But if for the Trinity, we don't we don't use that kind of you know that grammatical abuse, you know we we can't use that, right? So there's one God because the three persons all share the same essence, and they have the same divinity. And we also distinguish the divine persons by their hypothetical characteristics. So that's where the the unlikeness comes from, right? Is that they are different persons, and so we know that they're different persons because they have different personal characteristics. So, um, existing as unbegotten, that relates. That's a personal characteristic of the Father. Um, existing as begotten, being begotten from the Father, that's a personal characteristic of the Son. Existing as proceeding from the Father, that's a personal characteristic of the Holy Spirit. Of course, this gets into filioque debates again. I've done new, numerous videos on that topic. You can go check them out. I'm not going to be talking about here. A different way you can use, I guess, you can say that. God is one universe, so we call that God, and then three particulars, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But it really depends on what you mean by particular and universal. I mean, for example, generally people think that particulars subsist in the universal or have that kind of a view that you know, universal is a collection of particulars. We don't have that view, right? So um, <clears throat> we will say that universal subsists in each particular. So um, that's why we will also say that each of them are one God. And again, there is a good reason why it will be incorrect to say that each of the persons of the Trinity are, you know, we will consider them like different gods, right? There, there are, I've outlined multiple different reasons why that will be severely incorrect. And I think I spent enough time explaining that. So I want to explain again, talk about the incarnation next. Uh, he says an eternal God cannot come into time and die. Well, again, that depends on your definition of eternality. I mean, I don't have to accept your definition because it seems like your definition is very much in dialectical opposition to time, right? It's, it's like, you know, oh, um, eternality means that you're absolutely in no way uh, bound to time. Or I guess that's not a correct way to... What I'm trying to say is, a better way to explain this, is immateriality, right? <clears throat> we say God is immaterial. Does that mean that we are saying that God has the divine power of like not being able to have a body? No, right? Now, essentially, he doesn't have a body. Does that mean that, you know, having a body will contradict him? There's a difference between not having a body, right? You know, essentially speaking, and having a body contradicting you. There's, there's actually a very subtle difference between the two. A God is immaterial. But God, by his own free choice, can manifest in creation, right? So God is eternal, but that doesn't mean that he's unable to uh, appear in time and space, <clears throat> right? That's putting limitations to God. And the reason why we can say that is because we believe in the essence distinction. So we believe that God, um, in his inner reality, in his essence, can remain what he is, while also interacting with creation according to his free choice, through his energies, right? So we, we can talk about the Theophanies in the Old Testament, uh, the, the appearance of the burning bush, that's, you know, God being present in the burning bush. Uh, we can talk about Exodus 33, uh, Moses and God speaking face to face. There are, more, you know, Jacob wrestling with God. I mean, there are many different examples, and these are not just some metaphors. It's really, it's, it's God's presence manifesting in creation, right? Uh, it can be true mediums, but it's still God fully manifesting in creation uh that doesn't mean he becomes part of creation it means that he has control and the creation is under his domain and he chooses to come into creation for for a purpose right so we don't have we don't believe in that this kind of definition of you know this dialectical definitions of immor you know immortality or eternality or immateriality immutability right impassionate you know these are definitions that um we have different understandings of these definitions and so we understand that god is beyond those things right so for example we say god is beyond existence but i mean aren't all apologists trying to argue that god exists right so how are we going to argue god is beyond existence and then say god exists at the same time well if you believe that god is beyond existence but he you know existence is a characteristic of him 
then you can say that. Well, if you say both of those things are essential, then you kind of have to you kind of have to define what you mean by that because if they, if they're both you know beyond being beyond existence in essence and then being existence in essence, that's that is kind of contradictory, right? But if you say that you know God's you know existence is an energy of God, and that God in His essence is beyond existence and beyond essence, etc., then you know that's not that's not contradictory. That's correct. Uh, so, so that's another point that I want to make. And so this is pretty much connected with the, the atonement. But the point that I'm trying to make with the incarnation is that God can come into time and space, take on a human nature that is a human body and a human soul, incarnate with it and act in it throughout creation. Right. So God can be at a time and space, you know, time and space. But that doesn't contradict him being omnipresent and omniscient. You know, God can. <clears throat> he, God can be both. They're not contradictory to each other. The only thing that contradicts God is evil, right? God by nature is good. The only thing that contradicts God is evil. And this is the part where I get into the atonement because um, he's acting as if sin is just some personal moral mistake and that, that that's just all sin is. It's just a like personal wrong. And so he's basically trying to make this like baby tear argument, which is just really insulting. But He's making this baby tear argument that, well, another person cannot pay for my sin because my bad decisions are my responsibility. It's like baby's first philosophy to your, to your argumentation. I mean, you should be ashamed of yourself. First of all, you have really no respect for other people's beliefs and other people's religion. That's why you have no respect for yourself. I mean, this is such a stupid argument. Really, I can't. I, I, I don't know what these people think. Okay, I don't, I don't know what they have in their mind. I know this guy's going to go into a damage. So that's not what I meant. I didn't mean that. But, you know, we, we all know that, you know, we all know what you mean here. OK, um, the, the definition of sin here is totally wrong. But to kind of track back to the talk about evil, um, evil is movement away from God. So that's why evil contradicts God, because evil is, you know, tr opposing God. Right. God obviously not is not going to oppose himself. Um <clears throat> And, you know, evil is also a privation, it doesn't have substantial existence, it is a move away from the good. And so evil has its own, you can say, powers, even though it's, it's, it's a strange, you know, it's a strange term to use because, you know, it doesn't have substantial existence. But one of it, as St. Paul says, the wages of sin is death, right? So the manifestation of sin, um, the moment of sin is death, right? And death itself is corruptibility. Corruptibility is movement to death, right? So starting from life and moving to death, um, which is a result of Adam's sin, which we call ancestral sin or original sin in the West. Um, and so this gets into the point of the, of the atonement is that Christ's atonement is not just some weird moralistic thing where he's like, oh, you guys did bad things. Well, uh, take it all on me. I'm going to die for you. Well, that's not, I mean, that's, that's a parody of the atonement, right? Now the atonement, you know, there is penal, you know, atonement, of course. Um, but it's not just some, oh, I, we made more bad moral decisions. Let's blame you. You're going to be our blame. You're going to be our scapegoat. Um, that's at most you see this being used analogically, right? <clears throat> but there's much more to it than that. So, um, sin, again, is something that affects our humanity. It's something that, you know, destroys our very being. Okay? And it leads us to death. So Christ, first of all, being God, being life himself, Christ didn't have sin. He, is, he was without original sin. So he was, his, his human nature was in the Adamic state. But he assumed uh, passions which were blameless. So, for example, hunger. I mean, if you get hungry... You're not sinning, right? You're not sinning for getting hungry. But hunger is a result of the fall. It's something that occurs um, in the fall. So, you know, as, as, a, as a process, I suppose, as a result of the fall. And uh, <clears throat> Christ assumes these things to <coughs> deify our weakness. And really to get back, to get to the stronger point is that Christ becomes man to deify us. And by deifying us, he is saving the entirety of creation and taking it all in himself, which again, it's a, it's a biblical, these are biblical terms here. These are not just some Neoplatonic, weirdo, schmango, schmango terms. These are 
actual biblical terms, taking all, all in all in himself. Um, since man is the head of crown of all creation, all creation is going to be recapitulated in Christ who becomes man. So the salvation of the entire cosmos starts with man himself because creation was made for man. And uh, Christ de deified us, he deified our actions or um, or adventure on our acquisition to virtue, which is him, right? But he was he was uh, crucified, first of all, to fulfill the prophecies and also that, you know, that sin will be taken on himself. But again, what is the sin being taken on himself? Is it just or this like vague understanding of our personal moral fault? No, that's not what he's taking on himself, right? We still, unless we repent, we still have the guilt of sin. But what he's taken on himself is the destination, you can say, of sin, which is, you know, death and Hades. This is why uh, Christ opens the doors to paradise. And when he dies, he takes on sin in, in himself. And there are many church fathers that point out, uh, St. Gregory Theologian, St. John, John of Chrysostom being the main ones, uh, pointing out that he took on sin not by being a sinner, so he doesn't become a sinner. We are the sinners, but he takes on death in his human body and soul. So death for a human person is the separation of the body and soul. So Christ's human soul goes to Hades, or you know, if you want to call it, we can call it hell. So he goes to the underworld, he preaches the gospel, and the righteous accept the gospel and are saved. And in his descent to Hades, we we understand and know. That it is like, a, a, it is like the sun, as if the sun it like just went into a cave. A cave is full of darkness; you can't see anything, and then the sun just lightens everything up, and you can see everything. Or like a flashlight, right? That to use a less extreme analogy, you you go into a cave with a flashlight, you know, you light everything; everything can be seen now, right? That's pretty much what happened uh, after Christ descended there, and so the the headquarters of death was exposed, and Christ destroyed death by death. And so when we say Christ destroyed death by death, and by the way, this is the Paschal Traparim, we're going to be singing this this Sunday, so especially to those Orthodox, but really anyone watching this video, go to an Orthodox church this Sunday um, at 11 p.m. On, on Saturday, starting 11 p.m. on Saturday, because, you know, that's when we started uh, Easter services. You're going to see something really fun. But um, to, to get back to the point is that, you know, that is what the defeat of death is. And this is why the resurrection is so significant, right? Is because God has baited death, killed death with the cross, right? That's why the cross is venerated and is considered important because it is like, it is an instrument that Christ used to defeat death. And so the resurrection, you know, completes the defeat of death and uh, it, it opens up a door to the attainment of eternal life. And so, when he comes the second time, then there's going to be an eternal, you know, judgment. But um, his resurrection pretty much confirms the defeat against death, and this is why it, um, this is why it is considered to be kind of the main point of Christianity is the resurrection, not really the crucifixion. So Christ takes on death in Himself, and by doing so, He destroys the tool of uh, the enemy, and the cross is used as a weapon against it, and He resurrects by His own divine power. So to basically say that this is what we are all predestined to have, right? The resurrection is predestined to all of us. We're all going to be bodily resurrected. Our human body is going to reunite with our human souls. And we are going to be in union with Christ. But the experience of this is going to be dependent on um, whether God predestined to uh, send you to hell from the, the start of your creation. No, that's not what we believe, right? The experience of this is going to be dependent on the, the way in which, you know, your will was used, right? And so if you were moving to God in your life, in the eternal life, you're going to be moving to God eternally. That is, union with God is going to be in a blessed state, right? So this ever being will be ever well-being. But if you have moved away from God and you feel opposed God throughout your life, well, in the eternal life, you you yourself are going to choose to move away from God, which is to evil. So it will be ever ill being, right? So to to summarize what I've been been saying about the atonement is that when Christ is crucified on the cross, that is not Him dying for our personal sins or the the personal sins we commit are proper to our hypostasis. That is dependent on how we use, you know, or our nature, I suppose. 
so the you know the likeness because in the fall our image was corrupted and we lost the likeness so we still have the image of god well i guess not corrupted is it corrupt is not the correct word but we still have the image of god we're still made in the image of god because that is proper to our nature but we've lost the likeness which is proper to hypostasis that is person and so um we are to reattain that likeness to god right so uh that whether we accept god's gift in the atonement is going to be dependent on how we employ and use our mode of building which is proper to our person not that the will, will is proper to nature but the mode the employment of the will is proper to our persons right and that should get us much closer to correctly understanding the atonement and this is what a lot of people will call the christus victor model of atonement uh, it doesn't deny that christ died for our sins in fact it affirms it but it gives you know it's not just some one-time thing and then we continue doing what we're doing it's kind of like an uh giving us an entrance to his eternal glory right so that's pretty much one of the major points of the atonement and so again this this video the whole point was kind of just summarize these things again if you want a very detailed breakdown um in terms of the trinity and christology i have many videos they will be in the description below uh, in terms of atonement i will recommend seraphim hamilton who's another uh, orthodox christian who talks about this i mean jay dyer of course as well i mean he's good on this subject as well but to kind of give you an idea is that we believe in the christos victor model of atonement um and again this model you don't see it in the west uh, but it is in the east and it is patristic and this is what really what all of these different stupid errors you know end up having is that they're not you know these beliefs that he is criticizing no christian uh from the first century to the 21st century when i say christian i'm talking about like no christian in the ancient times believed in these things right heretics believed in these things and they were not the majority right uh, there were there were some fluctuating periods where they were maybe the majority but like that's only like one factor of it right in terms of like laity um that's not really true right so christians never believe that the father son and the holy spirit are the same person christians um th they don't believe that we have a sin nature the christians don't believe that uh they don't believe in eternality like the same way you think um, they believe that God can appear and manifest in time and space. Um, Christians uh, don't think that Christ died. I mean, it's literally in the Old Testament that you cannot, you know, that you cannot be persecuted or punished for another person's personal sins. But when we're talking about sin affecting our nature, that's a different topic, right? That's re relating to original sin that, re that relates to the attack towards us from the enemy. That's a different topic, right? And so... That's what the atonement kind of is about, is defeating uh, death, defeating sin, and attaining victory over it. So this should pretty much, I think, um, summarize pretty much the main points. And I hope this was helpful. If it wasn't, again, you can check the links in the description below. The videos are longer. They will be more beneficial for you. Um, and there are a lot more, I would say, focused. And, you know, you, you'll see sources cited, etc., and all of that kind of stuff, if that's uh, if that makes you happy. So before I end this video, I want to thank to all of my, I want to give a thank you to all of my Patreon financiers, Onan, Diet Sodalite, Allison, Eddie, Far Justin, Node, Maximus, Mitch, Jonathan, Stephen, Vlad, Kerry, Ignatius, Mike, Jack, Nectarius, Flood Basement, Dave, Colton, Seraphim, and Norbert. Thank you all for supporting my channel financially. Um, and thank you all for watching this. I will see all of you in the next video. And may God be with you all. Goodbye and prepare yourself for the day of the resurrection on Saturday, 11 p.m. Go to your local Orthodox church. Goodbye.